Greetings, everyone. Glad you've clicked on this link and that you're able to join us today. There are a lot of students, professors, and practitioners who are new to emergency management. So the purpose of this series is to provide some short videos to help expand your knowledge about some key issues in this important discipline and profession. In this edition of Disaster Hack, we're going to talk about how to manage disasters at the local, state, and federal levels. We'll talk about the incident command system and also emergency operations centers. We'll also provide some reminders about the standard emergency management system as well as other federal coordinating structures. Let's get started. As I mentioned, we're going to cover several different topics today. I hope you will learn more about the concepts of ICS and EOCs. I want you to understand a very unique mandate regarding ICS in the state of California, and you'll be exposed to the National Incident Management System and the National Response and Recovery Frameworks. Let's begin with ICS, or the Incident Command System. I really like this definition by Irwin. He suggests that ICS is a set of personnel, policies, procedures, facilities, and equipment that's integrated into a common organizational structure with the purpose of improving emergency response operations of all types. ICS emerged as a proposed organizational structure due to fires that affected California in 1970. These fires were very severe and burned for 13 days. They covered more than 500,000 acres, destroyed over 700 structures, and killed 16 people. They taxed the fire departments that were responding to them. An organizational structure named FireScope was created. FireScope stands for Firefighting Resources of Southern California, organized for potential emergencies. This organization studied the event and found that there were many challenges and mistakes relating to poor communications, insufficient intelligence and prediction, a lack of joint planning, and inadequate resource management. They proposed a new organizational structure to address these deficiencies. ICS, the Incident Command System, was the result. The structure of ICS includes several components, whether at the command or general levels. Incident Command includes one or more leaders who work to direct the response operation. This could include one fire chief, multiple fire chiefs, or the leaders of police and fire departments from the same or different jurisdictions. The incident commander or commanders work with three other officers. One focuses on the sharing of information within the organization and with others. Another concentrates on safety, making sure that no responder is harmed or injured. Another collaborates with external departments, agencies, and organizations. Under incident command, there are four sections. Planning helps to determine what is going on with the hazard and what must be done now and in the future to address life safety and other issues. Operations implements the plan and addresses all functions that must be performed in the emergency or disaster. Logistics provides all of the human and material resources that are required to implement the plan and fulfill life-saving operations. Finally, finance and operation tracks expenses and ensures payments are made to the appropriate party. Let's look at a hypothetical example. Imagine that a fire has broken out at a chemical plant. The first fire chief on scene becomes the incident commander. He or she is concerned about the safety of the crew, so a safety officer is appointed. This person must identify what type of hazardous materials are in the facility. Because the media has arrived on scene, a public information officer is identified. This person shares relevant information with reporters. About this time, there is concern that the fire is getting out of control. The belief is that the apartment complex needs to be evacuated that's nearby. A liaison officer is assigned to notify police and the Red Cross. In addition, because things are getting out of hand, a planning section is open to monitor the expansion of the fire, the shifting winds, and how to tackle the fire which now includes explosions and rocketing hazmat containers. Since the fire is expanding, additional alarms are issued. 
a more seasoned fire chief arrives and takes over and works with the in existing incident commander. The different crews are organized under operations section to improve coordination. Since the event is dragging on, a logistics section is established to provide fresh crews, water and foam, food and other communication resources. Finally, the finance and administration section is open to track expenses and make sure bills will be accurate and provided to the appropriate party. Besides creating an organized operational structure, ICS also incorporates several principles. A common terminology helps people to communicate clearly and effectively, and TIN codes are avoided. Modular design allows the organization to expand and contract as needed. Integrated communications ensures the various parties can talk to one another. Unity of command implies that people have one supervisor, so there are no conflicting directions. A unified command structure suggests that different leaders in incident command work together to manage the incident. The consolidated incident action plans are documents used to foresee what will happen and how the response will unfold over time. A manageable span of control is a principle that means a leader will only have about five people that report to him or her at any given time. Designated incident facilities are relevant in identified locations such as the incident command post, staging areas, and the HELA base. Comprehensive resource management indicates that everyone will know what resources are available, deployed, or broken. Now one thing to keep in mind is that there may be more than one incident command post in a disaster. For instance, there could be different incident command posts relating to a collapsed building, broken gas lines that result in a fire, the evacuation of nursing homes, a mass fatality operation, or other command posts for neighboring jurisdictions. ICS is a great organizational structure and there are many advantages of the system. These include contact among response leadership, increased safety, improved information flow, a logical way of organizing the response, joint planning, clear management expectations, and effective management of resources. However, there are some potential drawbacks. Three of those will be mentioned here. For instance, the focus on command may hinder coordination. Also, ICS is a field level focus and it's unable perhaps to address strategic issues in larger disasters. This brings us to EOCs or emergency operations centers. As noted, ICS is a field level operational structure. It's used by first responders in emergencies and disasters. In contrast, EOCs are typically open to disasters and they usually include many departments, agencies, and organizations. I like what Perry notes about EOCs. He says that they are locations, in this case buildings. Here's an example. There is often a main room where most of the representatives of different organizations are seated. In addition, there could be rooms for the media and decision makers. There's also break rooms and bathrooms, and even sleeping arrangements for long drawn out disasters. Getting back to Perry's work, EOCs provide an organizational structure, whether that's based on ICS, emergency support functions, or another type of arrangement related to tasks and assigned organizations. Finally, EOCs perform a variety of functions. Let's take a peek at those activities. Quarantelli suggests that there are seven functions that EOCs perform. While there may be more functions than seven, the following are indeed common ones that can be identified in emergency operations centers. These include information gathering, policy making, operations management, coordination, hosting of visitors such as the governor or the president, public information, and record keeping. Another point I want to make about emergency operations centers is that there's often more than one EOC in a major regional disaster. Each city has a main EOC. Sometimes an individual department may have their own EOC. Then the county and state may have active EOCs. Furthermore, a regional office for FEMA may have an EOC open, 
and FEMA may have an EOC activated at the national level. Therefore, the important thing to keep in mind is that there are many EOCs and they may each coordinate with each other to respond to the disaster. Several principles should be kept in mind to manage emergency operations centers. First of all, it's important to have a backup location in case your EOC is impacted by a disaster. You need to control access to the EOC to make sure that not everyone can enter the EOC. Require breaks for those working in the EOC. Ensure that there are adequate and trained backup personnel. Provide clear information in the EOC when you're managing operations and perhaps even put someone in charge of the EOC. Now that we have covered EOCs, let me briefly mention their relationship to incident command systems. This is simplistic, of course, but incident command systems are field level, they focus on first responders and tactical operations, and often make requests for resources. In contrast, EOCs are a central location with key department leaders. They make strategic decisions and provide resources. In this sense, they are both essential and interdependent. Okay, so there's just a few more points I want to share with you. First, some states like California mandate that first responders and some aspects of emergency management operate under incident command systems. There are also requirements regarding interoperable equipment. This is known as the standard emergency management system in this particular state. It came about after witnessing many challenges during and after the Oakland Hills fire. Second, like California, the federal government has also mandated that first responders and other emergency management organizations operate under the structure and principles of ICS. This was created after police and fire had trouble communicating and coordinating with each other during the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Third, I want to reiterate that the federal government may become involved in major disasters, so it's imperative that you understand how it operates. Many of the federal response functions are identified in the National Response Framework. The NRF lists primary and support agencies that complete emergency support functions ranging from firefighting and logistics to mass care and search and rescue. Fourth, and finally, other post-disaster functions are contained in the National Disaster Recovery Framework. In this case, such functions are longer term than those specified in the National Response Framework. They include activities relating to housing, the economy, and the rebuilding of infrastructure. These are noted as recovery support functions. To wrap up this video, let me remind you that ICS is a field level operational structure. An EOC is often a multi-organizational coordinating structure. Some states like California mandate SIMS. The federal government also requires operations that are consistent with NIMS, the NRF, and the National Disaster Recovery Framework. If you would like further information about Incident Command, EOCs, SIMS, NIMS, the NRF, and the NDRF, I have a chapter in my book that addresses these important subjects. Best wishes and have a great day.